say some replies? <laughs> Now, first of all, I'd like to say, I don't think anybody in the history of it, uh, he said a lot of very uh, flattering things. I thank him very much for them. But, uh, you know, I don't think in the history of magic anybody has the audacity to come up like I do, and, and I have nothing to rate. I mean, I work absolutely ad lib. I don't think any two of my lectures would be exactly the same. But I, I'm very anxious to do something to please everybody in the audience. I mean, later on, I do a few of the classics to show you a few basic moves, and then I'm going to go and do some tricks, and then I will answer questions in the next session. I mean, after it, and that can go on as long as you can bear with it. But anyway, before I start, I'd just like to say, uh, uh, this is very apropos of this evening, a little story that, you know, a lot of people think of the ink. Oh, incidentally, I don't wear this kind of outfit here to show off, but when you get this inner circle magic, uh, inner circle decoration in London, that's a magic circle, they make you take a note that any time you attend a magical function of any kind, you'll wear it. So that's why I'm wearing this little pinky from the magic circle. Well, <laughs> anyway, that's the reason. Not to show off or anything like that. But I would like to say that a lot of people are talking about England. They don't think that the English have a sense of humor. But I'd like to tell you a little story that Cary Grant told the other night at the Academy Awards dinner we had in Hollywood. He told a very little story, which I think is apropos of what I'm doing tonight. He told a story of a couple who were on the floor dancing, and a girl and her husband, I don't know if it was a husband or a boyfriend, whoever it was, they were dancing on the floor. And all of a sudden she said, oh dear, she said, my necklace broke, it fell down. And he said, well, he said, wiggle a little, shake a little, it'll fall on the floor. So she shook a little, and it didn't fall on the floor. And he said, shake harder, so she shook, and said, oh, it fell down around my waist. And he, he said, well, shake some more. So she did another shimmy and shook, and then she said, oh, it's fallen around the back. So, so she, she said to him, she said, well, put your hand on my back and get it. He said, not out here on the dance floor. He said, everybody said, very embarrassing. I don't want to put my... He said, do it quickly. Put your hand down the back. So he, he said, listen, with all these people looking, I feel a perfect ass. She said, never mind the compliments. She said, get the thing. But anyway, I want to say that because I feel like a perfect ass when I have to discover some of you fellows are probably much more adroit and cleverer than I am. So this is rather audacious to come up here and spout. But I'm not trying to spout any knowledge or anything. I'm going to show you some of the things that I've picked up from, not myself, but from magicians all over the country. I mean, I, I knew Keller, I knew Herman, I, I didn't know Herman. I mean, Herman died the era, but I knew Keller and I knew Thurston, I knew Houdini very well. In fact, Mrs. Houdini is my boy's godmother. She's not, of course, she's dead now. But I've known all the magicians, and I've had good advice from all the magicians. I mean, I listen. When people, anybody should listen to criticism. I mean, and that's, uh, a lot of people don't. They say, oh, who's this guy? He doesn't know what he's talking about. But there may be a thought. Even a, a dumbbell can give you a criticism sometimes that's very, that's very helpful. So a person should always listen and heed criticism, whether it's good or bad. But anyway, I, I'm going to show you a few basic things with this oldest trick in the world, the cups and balls. Now, the only reason I'm starting with this old ancient trick is because this is one of the few tricks in that that embody at least five or six different effects. A lot of uh, the amateur magician doesn't know, like the professional, what an effect is. He often thinks because he makes five dexterous moves and a lot of subtle moves that it, that has nothing to do with the effect. The effect is the result, what the person sees. I mean, that's why a simple effect like throwing your card and make it stick to the ceiling. People can understand that. They know what happened. But if you lay out five piles of cards and you have to divide a number in half and do something, it's all big cloud. It's not a clear-cut effect. But this cups and balls, look, if you do the inside, in the old days, they always would show the cup and they'd say, if you measure the inside depth of the cup, you'll find it's deeper on the inside than it is on the outside. <laughs> now, that, 
that's a penetration effect. I mean, not a penetration, a deficit effect. No? Uh, most people, I do very quickly, they don't sell the thing. But if you put that in there, and when you pull it out, you slide your thumb down at the same time and do that very slowly, the effect is very good. So your thumb slides down, and you put it up, and so that's, that's a deficit uh, effect. When you not put, put one cup through the other, that's a penetration effect. And when balls pass from one cup to the other, that's a transposition. And when you get a load, that's a production. There's disappeared production. The miser's dream is only one effect, catching coins, catching coins. Of course, sometimes they put a penetration effect by pushing it through the side of the, the hat or through the side of the bucket thermal. But it's essentially one cigar production of cigarettes is a, is a production effect, purely a production effect. But the cups and balls, as I say, embody so many different effects. That's why it lives down through the, the years. I mean, it's a very effective trick. I'm just going to make a few moves. I'll run through this very quickly. I want to point out that there are endless the number of things. I mean, you can make cups and balls last for half an hour if you wanted to, because there are lots of different intricate moves you can do. But the essential thing is to do just the basic moves and never do more than two and a half or three minutes with the cups and balls. I'm taking more now because I'm talking about it. But I'll just run through it quickly. Then I want to point out some of the salient features in the cups and balls. You can, these balls are visible here. I think you can see them. Do a little move like this. You know, every time I do that, a lot of people are suspicious. They don't think the ball goes into the hand. It's all on the magic wand. When you have the magic wand, that makes it. Happen. by skill, by chicanery, trickery of some kind, but I assure you this is real Egyptian magic. As a matter of fact, the cups and balls originated in Egypt, not in India, as a lot of people think, but in Egypt, but very ancient Egypt trickery. Now to prove that this is pure magic, do you mind if I call you Judy? Your name is Judy. <laughs> Judy, there's three cups there, I want you to select whichever one you like. One on this side? All right, right there. Now I, I didn't influence your choice, now anyway, you could have taken this one out. Now look. Take the ball out like this. Now, that one's kind of stupid, doesn't it? But look, <laughs> look, right under the cup that you asked me to put it, it's no longer there, you see. Now, a funny thing, some people don't understand how this works. Now, suppose that you've chosen the one on this side. You have to be ambidextrous, do it with the other hand like that. And then see, whoop, and go. It's still there, it didn't go away. What happened there? <laughs> uh, get down to that. Anyway, now. Two over there, that's right. Now here's, here's the whole thing on this, this trick. I want to show you what. Three balls. Now these cups are really porous. You see, if you, if you drop a ball like that, pass it right through the cup. Watch. <laughs> No, oh, some people think that the ball is already there. Just room, two balls. Not room for another ball, but if you drop it carefully like this. Whoop, fell off, but all three balls are there. Now I'm going to make one more move, and I'll show you how this old trick is done. At least that's what you tell the audience. See, this, is very, <laughs> this is a very ancient trick. It's very hard to keep track of six or seven objects at the same time. The three balls, the three cups I use the wand. I toss all at the same time, so it becomes confusing. But when I do that, you must be convinced that there's a ball under each cup. Now, as I say, it's confusing. You have to keep track of all of it. So I'm going to make it very simple by putting one of these back in my pocket. I'll put this one back in my pocket. And I'll put this one back in my pocket. Now, if I put these two away, like that, that leaves one here. You see, this one has come back. I mean, but this one has come back. Now, the reason for that is very simple. People watch the wrong hand. When I go like this, most people look over here. They should be watching here. Now, I only pretend to put it in my pocket. I bring it down with my little finger, drop it behind the cup, and you see it's not really there at all. Just, but if I actually put it away, how many are there there, Judy? How many? Don't be afraid to say there's three then. <laughs> so if I put all three away and there's still one there, I must use an extra ball. It's rather hard working under these conditions here. But anyway. <laughs> I apologize for it. It's a little awkward working this way, as you can see. I mean, I'm a little proud here. But I want to show you just a 
the basic thing, the basic, uh, the most important thing is the low. Now, I mean, I just have these because I don't want to go out and buy lemons and potatoes and make it. I mean, you have to get fresh ones all the time, so I use these. But it's much more effective if you use a, a couple of, say, a sweet potato and a lemon and, or a tangerine, but use real fruit or, or vegetables or an onion. Much more effective than all that when you produce things. But let me show you the rolls now. The only reason I keep the rolls is I say it's rather awkward working under these conditions because they're not normal. I mean, I don't have a stool like that. But here, I just want to show you the actual rolls itself. Now, I put them in the back pocket here. Malini, Malini was the one that, the first one that I saw. Max Malini, you know, years ago, old Pop Krieger in, the, in New York but had quite a reputation for doing the cups and dolls. And the reason was that he used to produce white mice under the cups and dolls. The women used to scream and yell, but he produced a little white mice. But he had a servant behind the table. I mean, he had the cloth pinned up and had the white mice in there. And nobody did the cups and balls without the servant behind the table. And when I saw Molini work, and he used his hip pocket, I stole that idea from Molini. I mean, because up to that time, nobody ever did cups and balls without a servant, except Max Molini. No. But he used to use his back pocket. But anyway, here, now, I want to show you the, the load, the actual load. Well, first of all, I want to make a comment on a few, few very important points. You've got a ball under a cup like that, and and you're going to, you have another ball here. Now, you're going to, you're going to, pick this up and load the other ball. Now the manner of doing this is very important. I mean, here you've got a ball under here. Now, this applies to all types of magic. When you pick up something and load something at the same time, whether it's a coin or whatever it is, a sponge ball. But when you pick this up, now, I, it'd be very awkward if I picked that up and I did that. That would be very awkward. It would be unsightly and it wouldn't look well. So, you pick this up. Now, you look, now you, you see, you underplay this. You don't, you don't pick this up and go like this, or you, you pick this up, now you want to pick the ball up. So, you see, this action is very quick. In other words, you pick it up, to pick that up. The reason you put it in this hand is to free the hand so you're not awkward like that. So you pick it up, you do this, you do that quickly. So in other words, the action is this, the ball. See, in other words, this is all underplayed. I mean, the, the important thing is to point to the ball and load the other one. Now, that applies the same way when, I, when you tip the ball off like this. Of course, you got the ball here. Tipping it off is very easy because the ball, goes, as you tip it back, it goes right underneath. So those are two basic moves. Another basic move you can use, if you, instead of always make, making a pretense of putting the ball under there, you can really put the ball, drop it like that, and put your hand and put it down, and throw it up, see, you can put the ball like that and throw it. Of course, you're looking up, it's not a very good angle. If you're looking down, it's a much better illusion. But anyway, I want to get to the loads, the important, important thing. Now, after, after you put the balls underneath the cup, one under each, you still have this ball in your hand. Now you've got to get those balls out of your pocket. Now, it's always better to have four than three, a load four. Now, you can do the same thing with chickens. Incidentally, <laughs> <laughs> no, chickens are easier to load than the ball. <laughs> but you, the way to take chickens, the way to practice chickens is do like Francis Carlyle and Fawcett Ross and several people I know. You just take a pair of socks and roll them up, you know, the way you roll socks up and use Use socks, load socks underneath cups. <laughs> After you've done that for a little while, a chicken is much easier than the sock. I mean, it's a soft, fluffy thing, and a, a, a chicken, as long as it's not over two weeks old, is very easy to load under a cup. Well, anyway, you can load it under a large-sized china cup. You can use three china cups and do chicken. But anyway, I'll give you the load. <laughs> Here's the load. Now, you, you say this is too complicated, so I'm going to I'm going to put two of these balls away. Now, look, I take this ball, and see, uh, here's where this comes in. I put that, and I put that back, and I've loaded the other one under there. I scroll this in, and I make a, a move like that and put it in the pocket. Don't do this. That is, this is the worst habit a magician can have, to try to prove something. In other words, an honest person. This is a trouble, right, man? The average person is honest. They have good feelings. I mean, they don't like to cheat people. So they want to prove how very honest they are, so they do this. And they're not honest. They're, they're, they're being deceptive. When you put something in your pocket, you, you don't 
do this, put it in your pocket. You say, well, I'll put this one away, and then just you underplay it. You don't don't attach any importance to it. If you want to put a ball away and not put it away, just take the ball and say, well, we'll get rid of it. We'll get rid of it. We'll get rid of this one. Put it in your pocket and come out, and, and keep it in your hand. It's much better than doing this and trying to put it away. Never overprove in magic, because you always have a feeling of guilt. I mean, a lot of people, they do a double lift with cards. They, they want to prove that it's one card, and they snap it or something. Don't be guilty. If you have a feeling of guilt, you shouldn't have it. Anyway, look, now I get to the low. Here, here's the thing. You pick it, you, you got the three balls. You say, I'm going to simplify this by putting this ball back in my pocket. I'll put this one back in my pocket. You do nothing. Look, you just do this. Don't do this or, or do... Don't say look, I'll put it in my You laugh because you've seen the guy. No, a lot of people, they, they, what are they proving? You know, only an idiot would take a ball and put it in his hand. <laughs> Billy Jigger, that's what he used to talk about. You know, Roy Benson always says a Billy Jigger when he does the things. He's like a Billy Jigger. But anyway, here, here's the thing. You take the ball, you say, well, put this one away. Just make a move and put it away in your pocket. And say, in fact, I'll put two of them away. You know, you put this one and say, I'll put two away. Now, you want a little extra time to get that ball. So you, you do the same thing. You do the same thing again. You pretend to put it here. And you reach. Now you want to get this ball up. Because you've got to take a little, a little bit. It takes more time. So how do you gain that time? When you put the ball, you say, I put this one away. You say, that leaves. Look, see, now watch the time. You put the ball away. You say, that leaves one. But you see, I can I, I go into my pocket and get this. So here's what you do. You say, I'll do this again. Because I want this. Anybody can do this. If you remember what I say. Three balls. I'll put this one in my pocket. And I'll put this one in my pocket. You just keep loading the other. Now, you say, that leaves one under this. Cup. That, but that gives me time. That leaves one under this cup, but I've got this ball. And now I load this other one under there. Now I say this one has come back. Now this one comes in here, and you put this down. Now, you can't do that again because you get caught if you try to do the same move again. So now you vary the thing. You say, the trouble is watching the magician, you, you don't want, you should, can't watch both hands at once. But you, if you do this, you see, you're watching the wrong hand. It's over here. I only pretend to put it in my pocket. Now that gives you time to get this other ball up. And you say you drop it behind the cup. And as you bring this off, you load this one. Now you've got two of them loaded. But you say, if I really put this in my pocket, how many under here? Now whatever they say, you've got the third one here. You drop it down and you load the third one. Now when you put these away, and you say, which one has a ball? You get hold of the other ball. It's cramped here. Then you lift this up. And you've got one here. And you've got one here. And you've got one here. And you got one here, but that's very startling to people. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, now, I don't want to, uh, I only want, because that's a basic trick, and everybody should, you don't have to have a set of cups to do cups and balls. You can do it with kitchen cups or, or, or even lily cups, I mean those cardboard cups. The principle is the important thing to learn not to hurry it until the time. Now I want to show you. Now these coins, which uh, we're giving them with a photograph, I want to show you what you can do with these. Well, any, I mean, you don't have to use these coins. You can use any coins you want. You can use half dollars or, or, or silver dollars. I do this also with real silver dollars, but I'm using these coins. Everybody can put coins in their hand like that and hold them. I mean that way. It doesn't take any practice to do that. Now in the old days, they used to, as long as you're holding something, if you're holding something like that, you see your hand looks looks empty. If you've got the angle right, it looks empty. Now you can take, this is a very good opening trick. If you have a champagne glass, or in fact any kind of a glass with a, with a stem on it, any glass with a stem, a goblet, I think they call it goblet, don't they? Or this is a champagne glass, but I'll stand up and you can see this. No, I won't fall, don't worry. Oh, <laughs> it's all right. Now look, you, you see, I, I don't know, probably you can see up underneath here, I don't know, but if you're on this right level, you see, look, you can pass, look how simple you can make a changeover palm. Now this is a very pretty changeover palm and there's nothing to it. Here's what you do. You've got the coins there. Now if you wanted to change, change these coins from the, one hand to the other, you just take them out like that and you put them back. You pinch them out, take them back. So when you've got the glass in your hand, 
All you do is come over this way, take them out, and put them back. But look, when, when you got the illusion here, you got the glass this way, you, you see you walk on from this side, you walk on the platform from this side. You say, a little music professor, you see, look, this is just hell here. The hand is turned so they don't show. A little music. Now you can turn around on this side and say something over here. And you've transferred the back. Now, after that, you put the, you put the glass. After you do that, after you've done your changeover, I mean, you do this, and you do this, you bring back. Now you put the glass on, raise it up and put it on your hand. But look, I clipped the coin there. See, as you raise it up, Thank you. You see, as you raise the glass up, when you take alter the position, you just put the glass in between the fingers and push one coin over, and as you take hold of the glass, you clip it with these two fingers like that, clip the coin, and stand it on top of your hands, and you've got this coin clipped here. Now, you reach up, and you can get a coin. You drop it in the glass. Now you dump it out. All intents and purposes, you only have one coin. You take this coin and flip it or do whatever you want. With it. Now you come down like this and you put it in between your fingers. And I still have this one here. Well, I'll, do that. I'll just do this effect and I'll show you the movements here. And you do this. Take another. Now look, what you do is this. You see, you've got all the coins there. You catch one and when you come... Now this coin, when I hold that coin like this without doing anything, and that coin disappears from everybody. I mean, look, there's a coin. It disappears, but you know it's still in the hand, naturally. You know, I mean, in other words, you don't do any finger bringing. You just bring it out of the range of vision. There's a coin. Now, when I come down, when it goes out of the range of vision, I just clip it with these two fingers and pick up two of these coins and do a double lift, in other words. So it looks as if you take the coin from here and you put it between your finger and thumb. But you really got two coins here. Two, and the other ones are concealed here. Now you catch this one, which looks like another coin, and you pick up the other two and put them between your fingers. So now your hand is clean, and you can pick up a third one. You've got a third coin. Now, you take this third coin and you put it up here. So this is exactly like a billiard ball move. You put it there like that, and you've got, you've got another one. Now see what you do there. I'll show you the back view of that. You take the coin, when I put it in here, I just pick with those fingers and pull this coin away. So I'm in this position, and I turn my hand around, and I've got another coin. Now, there's still a two there together, two there together. So I, I click them like that, put that one there, and I've stolen the other one, and you put this one here. Now, you go from here, you should have something on the table here that I haven't, I'm gonna put a card case on here. You should have something on the table, which I haven't got. Now you take the coins and you you uh, put them down behind. You drop them down behind something. So then now you can take a coin and do this. Take one hard way around the back. <laughs> Over here. Now the reason you have that something there, you pick up absolutely nothing. There's supposed to be a fifth one there. You pick it up and go it. <laughs> now, for the finish, for the finish, I mean, this is a whole routine you can do just with coins. Take the coins this way. No, no. I'm a little awkward here sitting this way on the chair, but I want you all to be able to see it. But anyway, you do this, the retinal impression, which I'm, well, I, I, anyway, and then when you finish up, I don't take up too much time. You do this star, which, not typical, I mean, you do this. this. No, I want to show you, this, this star, this incidentally manual was the first one to do that. If you got any, you can do this with half dollars or quarters or anything. You fan them backwards. Don't fan them this way. Fan them, in other words, put them with your, see the coins are fanned on your fingers, like that. Now, all you do is put your fingers together like that, and your thumb, get all your four fingers together, your five fingers, and push, and the coins come out there. Stop. Now another little thing you can do if you want, you can drop them down like this when you got them here. You can drop them down, apparently do this, and then you can come over here this way. Now you can do this, 
and they go, and then you can do the start again. But look, this is so simple. Look, when you, you expand the knees backwards, like that, you do that. You spread your fingers up. But it makes a good finish when you do that. But if you want to drop them this way, it's not on the floor, it shouldn't drop them on the floor. Anyway, now, incidentally, this is, this, I want to show you this move, which you can do with 10 coins or more. This, this move of hitting and clicking here. Now, most people do that this way and take the two fingers and, and steal these coins. When they do this, they do this and they take with two fingers. It's much better just to do it with your, not to move anything, just take them with your, like that, see? Look, this finger comes over and you just take them with your finger and thumb. Now, if you put the coins there in the hand, show your hand empty, and you turn your hand and just point, it, it's, a, it's a very nice steal. You just hold them that way. So the same thing applies with one coin. Look, if you've got a coin, you put a coin like this and you do a, a vanish or something, and then you, you reproduce a coin. Now, when you, when you close your hand, close it this way. Now put your hand this way, show your hand, and as you turn the hand, just take the coin out. And it's, a, it's a very nice vanish. See, look, that's all you do, look. Don't move anything. Whereas if you do this, there's movement of the fingers. Most people do that that way. They do that and they come up there. But you see, the fingers move. The fingers move. And if, unless you crowd it in there, you can see the movement. This way, you just just turn your hand and steal it out. Hold it like that. It's a very easy move. Oh, incidentally, this, uh, this pass, known as the retinal impression or the persistence of vision, it's a very important thing. I learned this out of Art of Magic years ago when I was a boy, when Art of Magic first came out, Nelson T. Down's book. Now, they tell you, they give you the instructions, but they're not really the proper instructions. They tell you to put the coin here, close your hand, and straighten out these fingers. Well, I don't care how much you practice following those instructions, it's not going to look like anything. But look, if you take a coin, or take any of them, put it there and do nothing at all, just there, just do that. The illusion is good. Look, just that. Don't do anything. Just bring, if you take a coin and do that, and you do it with a sponge ball, you get a good illusion. And you do the same thing. You put a coin here. Now, by turning the hand a little this way, you lose track of the coin. I mean, you can't see the coin. Now, as the fingers close, you turn the hand a little this way till the knuckles hit there. Then you straighten up these fingers and drop the hand. Now, that's all blended into one move. It looks as if you put the coin in the hand. <laughs> and you can do it this way. You can pretend to put it up there like that and then do that. <laughs> no, look, look how easy. Look, you do this. But remember to turn the wrist. And do this. Now, the moment these fingers start to close, see, if I do that, you'll notice that immediately. I don't, oh, I start to do this. These three fingers straighten out and cover the coin like that. But it's done under cover of those fingers closing. Now that all blended into one movement, like this, and like this, and this. You can't do it slowly. It's got to be blended in one movement. But then it looks like a, that's exactly what I'm doing in slow motion. But the illusion is good. That's uh, called the persistence of vision, or the, uh, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to, there's so much as I say, here's a, here's a, oh yeah, I've got a dollar here. Let me show it. Get this dollar. <laughs> Here's, here's the thing that somebody asked me about a handkerchief trick, and I don't think really do any handkerchief tricks anymore, but this is a very good thing. You can take a dollar out of your pocket. You're going to do this, and you roll up, roll it into a cornucopia. And you produce a okay. Now this is our old friend. You can do this, and you put the dollar away in your pocket and get rid of the gimmick. But this is our old friend, the false finger. This is a very nice production, very easy to do should have it in your pocket. I had it in the bag. I should have put it in my pocket. But you load the silk handkerchief into the false finger. Now, Aide Duval, Aide Duval made very good use of a false finger in his act when he did the symphony in silk. He, he used the false finger for several other effects besides using the phantom tubes. But he used a false finger a great deal. But here's the, uh, after you get this thing loaded in, the, now, age of all, you should just have it. most of the magic books, the old Hoffman books, they tell you to put it in between these fingers. In other words, you've got five. But if you raise your hand this way, if you raise your hand this way and make some comment, you see, it, it, nobody knows you. <laughs> I put it between these fingers. Now, it's, it, 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 
the same thing, practically. Now, here, when I take, I, put your hand in your pocket, get out a dollar bill, and keep this here. Keep, but look, now this, this will rule you. If you take this out, it takes a very critical person to, to see anything in your hand. It looks very fair and square. See, you keep hitting this like that. You can bring your hand up. It looks as if you have nothing else. Now, here's what happens. When you take the bell, you've got this here. You hit it like that. Now, all you do is, is lay it across there like that. Just lay the finger there, clip it with your thumb, and make a, make a cornucopia around that finger like that. Then you can do any business you want and so on. You can have a this from a piano as you pull it out. Now, when, when you open out the bill, you just put your finger in there and take it like that. Now you can put the whole thing away, which is natural. You put a bill in your pocket, you're not going to throw it on the floor. And you can do the trick. Now I'll show you the trick. I'll show you this. Oh, that's all right. I do it right That would be the best trick of all. Now, here's the trick. <laughs> anyway, oh, I want to tell you something. You probably think I'm an idiot sitting up here like this, but I, you know, I, moved, I, I, I had Joe will tell you. I was in a marketplace for two years ago. Was it two years ago, Joe? Exactly. Somebody <laughs> spilled a jar of mayonnaise and a jar of jam on the floor, and I, I was carrying a dozen eggs and a loaf of bread, and I skidded in it, and boy, I landed on my hip. And, but anyway, I got a thousand dollar settlement from the from the marketplace, but I still have great trouble when I stand. I mean, it's very painful. But that's why I have to sit down to talk. So I can stand a little while. And wa I'm walking and all right, but standing, I have, I have severe pain. So I apologize for sitting down. But I want to show you this this trick because I want to point out something and a trick that you can do yourself and do very simply. There's no sleight of hand to it. And when I was a small, I'll do the trick as I used to do it. I say, when I was a small boy, I saw a Chinaman do a trick like this, poke a handkerchief into his hand. I thought it was going to disappear, but when it came out on the other side, it changed color. Now, of course, everybody seeing a trick like this, even a small boy, knows that you can't change the color of a silk handkerchief by passing it through your hand. See, the only thing is where and how do you conceal the other silk handkerchief? You must have two. Well, that's the thing I'm going to show you, how you conceal the other one. You see, you have a trap door in your thumb. You open up the trap door and up the door. Now, before you commence the trick, you see, it's very simple. Before you commence the trick, you have the red silk handkerchief tucked inside your hand. And you ladies know silk will compress it. Just the fact that this is barrel shaped. Look. You can put those in there, you can, you can, if you want to force them, you can put two 18-inch subs in this, in this without any trouble at all. But just the fact that it's power shaped. Perhaps you pass that around and look at it, see how nicely it's made. That was Paul Fox, he, he had those. <laughs> Returns later. <laughs> but pass it around, let someone look at it, it's nicely made. It's made it in barrel shape, but that's funny how much, what a bigger capacity it has. That, uh, and let's figure the past. Oh, well, I'll, uh, I just thought of something else, but I, well, I've got a handkerchief. Just, here, here's a one of Slidini's nylon handkerchiefs, but you could use any kind of a handkerchief. But I want to show you a knot. Of course, there are lots of trick knots with handkerchiefs. You know the knot known as Al Baker's knot, where you tie the knot and tie it this way and have somebody blow on it and it comes out. But that's well known. But this knot of Joe Berg's in Hollywood is not well known. And it's a funny thing, you know, Joe, Joe Berg invented this knot, and it's, it's hard to, he described it in one of his books, but people can't learn it out of the book. As a matter of fact, Joe can't do the trick himself, and he invented the trick. And every time I go in and see him, he says, hey, uh, show me that trick of not, not of mine, will you show me? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here, I'll show you what a nice effect this is. You can do this with any kind of a handkerchief, a linen handkerchief or a silk handkerchief or anything. I mean, you can do it with a woman's scarf, you tie a knot. You really tie a legitimate knot like that. You pull it like this. Take hold of the end of that way. Pull it gently. Ah, you see what a nice knot that is? It's entirely different from the principle of any other. Now here's the secret of that knot. When you show the handkerchief, you clip one corner between your fingers and you drape it over your hand. In other words, you drape the handkerchief over your hand. You still retain this one corner. Still retain that corner. 
You take these two corners and bring them up, still rotating this corner down in here. Now, you get that corner, I mean, put, don't hold it that way, hold it out of sight like that. As you bring this hand over, you put this other corner that you've gripped in its place, so that when you're really holding this handkerchief, you're not, you haven't got diagonal to corners, you've got, you see, you've got the same, wait, I'll do it again, you've got the same, in other words, when you're tying the knot, you're really tying like this, you see, you're not tying the diagonally opposite corners, you're tying these two corners together. Now, I'll do that again, but you clip this like this, take hold of, bring these up like that, switch this corner, You've got the other corner down in there. You really tie these two together with a single hitch. Now take hold of that little corner that's there, the other one, and pull the two corners together. And let go of this when you get here. I'm exposing that little tip set. Now you can pull that and very pretty knot. That's the old working knot. I want to show you, this is, I, I really feel a little that I've been trying something when I do this because one of our, I, I won't mention his name, but one of our best known professional performers made a reputation with this trick. I mean, this is where you, an index, any card called for out of the pocket. Now, this idea is my idea, this part of this, I mean, not an index, I mean, they were sold by Roderberg years ago in Chicago, but they had two indexes, one for each pocket. Now these cards, every card, I made these myself, an ace of clubs and an ace of spades. Ace of hearts and ace of diamonds. In other words, the cards are, are double cards. I, these are, and they fit in here like that. Now, incidentally, you can take these cards, I put them in the card case here, in here like this, but you can take a, just arrange these cards like this with a rough, couple of rubber bands around and if you want to do the trick only once, you can do it. Of course, this way you can repeat it over and over again when you've got a, a, a container like this. Look, here are the ten Jack, Queen, King. Ten Jack, Queen, King. I turn them over, they're, they're the opposite way. So if I want the ten of spades, I bring it out that way. If I want the Jack of spades, turn it over. That's the ten Jack, Queen, King. Here we have the six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean six, seven, eight, nine. And here two, three, four, five two, three, four, five. So you can see how simple it is to get any card, any card you want. If it's a black card, you go in here. If it's red, you come on this side. And supposing you want that, supposing you want the seven of hearts, look, you know, you just go down, you know that's the six. You pull that up and at there, and go right down and pull out your seven of hearts, or your eight, or whichever one you want. But there's a funny thing, you can just stagger the cards like that and put an elastic band around them, all in rotation, don't make it hard, but you've got to have big double-faced cards right, and put them in your pocket and you can easily reach in there and pull out any card. It's a very handy thing to have because of some, oh that reminds me, I'll tell you a funny thing that happened with Fred Keating. Because sometimes a fellow, when you're doing tricks, you grab the cards and stick a card in his pocket and say, all right, tell me what this card is, tell me what this card is, make it a little uncomfortable. Fred Keating was working in Park Avenue many years ago and there was a drunken fellow at the party and he said, all right, Mr. Keating, he says, tell me what, he grabbed the card and put it in his pocket, he says, tell me what this card is. And Keating was a very gentleman, and nice kind of a guy, and he said, uh, well, later, seven, later, 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 and he kept saying, oh, tell me the card, now never mind those other tricks, tell me what I've got in my pocket. He made himself very obnoxious, but Keating ignored him, and when he went home about four o'clock in the morning, he called, he got the name from the host, he got the name of this man, and he called him on the phone, and a very wealthy man, the butler, said, I'm sorry, he said, he's retired, so you can't talk to him. He's retired several hours ago. And when Keating said, tell him it's a matter of life and death. I have to talk to him immediately. And said, oh, all right, sir. So Frank said, I, he was, you're Mr. So-and-so, I just want to tell you the card in your pocket is the queen of diamonds. <laughs> because Keating looked at the back and saw the card was missing, and he, but he, he got it. Oh, here, oh, incidentally, here, here's another thing. Here, you know, uh, this this can be done with any. You know, I have this in a book out of the dice trick with the, that that uh, 
Incidentally, Leipzig always did. I've got the small size dice, but you can't see them here. These little dice. Well, perhaps you can't know. Here, you may be able to see them. Here, I'll do it. To, no, they're too small. Can't see. But here, I'll show you with these dice. And this is a nice routine. I mean, of course, it's, it's much better with smaller dice than it's really a close up trick. But if you take the dice like this, now everybody knows that the opposite sides of a die add to seven. If you got a six there, you got an ace, you got a four, you got a three, they add to seven. But if you put two together, it must add to 14. So in other words, if you've got 11 on the top, you've got to have three on the bottom, because 11 and three make 14. Now, that's, these are straight dice. There's 11 there and three on the bottom. Now, I'm going to make them crooked, you see. Instead of being 11 here and three on the bottom, I'm going to make them crooked. So I just do that. You see, now we have 11 there and 11 there. Now, it's impossible to have 11 there and 11 there on dice. That's, they're not made that way. They're made with a three there and a three there, see? Now, we, we take a, let me see, we take a, a five and a two. All right. But anyway, wait, I, 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 know, I want to do a bit of small dice because it doesn't look well enough for this. You have to visualize. Uh, with a small dice, this is a perfect illusion. And as a rule, you see, it's done this way. It's done on the side like that. But people, when you're doing a trick like this for only a group of three or four people, it's hard for the other people to see. If you do it facing this way, it's, it's very effective. And they, I think you can see, you guys with good eyesight can see this. You just put a six and a, and a five together. Six and a five. Now this move is perfect when you do it with small dice because you say there's 11 there, and you turn it very slowly, and three there. <coughs> so instead of doing it sideways like this, it's 11 there, and three there. 11 and three. Now I'll make them crooked. Now we have 11 there and 11 there. 11 on both sides. Now it's impossible to have 11 on both sides because what you have is 11 there and 3 there. And see, I mean, this turn can't be seen when you when you do that. Now, now after you, you say, so we have 11 there, you say, and 11 there. Now you say, of course, it's impossible to have 11 there and 11 there because what you have is actually 3 there. You have 3 there and 3 there. Now, we make a, a five with the dice. Now, what other way can you make five with a pair of dice? With a four and a one. So if I could take one of those outside spots and move them over to those blank spaces there, that would make a four there, leave one there. But I've got to do that and leave this nine on the bottom. Not change that nine and make this into a four and a one. And leave the nine on the bottom. And remember, nine on the bottom, no move, now you see it's a four and a one, and the nine is still on the bottom. Then you say, now that one is facing to my left, and we have a nine on the bottom. If the one is facing the left, nine on the bottom, but now the one is facing in, so on. But that's a very nice little trick. I mean, it's, it's described in one of my books, but it's a very good little close-up trick, and it's a very simple trick to carry. All you need is a couple of little dice in your pocket, but it's a good trick to do. Oh, incidentally, I haven't got, I, I didn't buy any salt, but I want to show you the gimmick that Roy Benson and Fred Capps, and I think I was the first one to use this gimmick, although Paul Fox was the one that, yeah. I haven't got any, I've got very little salt left. I, I've got to have it fill this with, uh, I didn't pick up any more salt. I should have stolen some from the restaurant when I was there. <laughs> but anyway, this is a gimmick. Now, this gimmick can be, this is, incidentally, I, I, I showed some fellows in the castle how to make these. You can just take a, a golf, I mean not a golf ball, a, a ping pong ball, and take with your little hand and take a piece of celluloid and make a little neck and, with aeroplane glow, fasten it on. It's just as efficient as this. This is made of aluminum. But anyway, you see this thing originally was made for Abe Duval, Paul Fox. It was from producing a handkerchief. Age of Law used to have a handkerchief, and then he, and he banished the handkerchief in the same thing, and he used to put his hand, you know, he, he, he could he fit on the fingers, and he used to show his hand like this and do this, and then he could palm it this way and so on. But he used it for a handkerchief trick. And Paul Fox said this would make a good gimmick. He said he'd do something else with it, a salt trick. So when I was out in Colorado some years ago, I worked out this way of handling it, and I showed it to Roy Benson. And Roy Benson told me, he said, I owe you $1,000 for that trick, because he made a great thing out of it. He did feature it in his act for him. And of course, Fred Capps does it too. But this is the same gimmick that both Fred Capps and, and uh, 
cheating. I mean, Fred Capps and Roy Benson, you. But here's the gimmick. Now, you, when you, if you're going to do this trick, you have this gimmick in your pocket, and you have it in your pocket, and you, so you pick up a salt shaker and take the lid off, and when you put the lid away, you just come out with a gimmick. You see, you can palm this very neatly because it's clipped this way. Now you can, if you want to do some, you can show your hand if you want to, but it's not necessary because you get the gimmick in this hand. I, I haven't got much salt here. I'll just pour it in. I want to show you how you actually do the, uh, I haven't got enough salt. I've only got about, because it'll take the full salt shaker full of this, this gimmick. But anyway, now you, you knock the salt off, apparently, off your hand like that, and then you come up with your, it vanishes. Now you pull up your sleeve. Look, you've got it on your finger. You pull up your sleeve. But you transfer, transfer the gimmick here. You pull up your sleeve. I mean, after the thing is gone, your hand like this. Now, you, you reverse the thing. See the grip? Now watch how this, when it's reversed, watch how I can do this flow. I mean, uh, you can, I can, you know, I mean, you can let this flow and flow and flow. And see how it comes out? I can shut it off. I can stop it any time and let it run again. But as I say, I haven't got enough salt here, but I thought you might be interested in saying the original gimmick that they use. or handy can make one of these. As a matter of fact, Danny Du in Phoenix, he, I think he sells it these, I don't know, but he used to have some. But it's a very nice gimmick. <coughs> this is a trick, I, I tell you, I won't do it with a net. I won't bother to get two people to hold a net with this trick, but I want to show you this. This, of course, you don't do the cups and balls in this trick all at the same time because they're too, they're too, too similar, I mean, to do a trick like this. But this trick is a very effective trick, you know, Silent Mora. It's a funny thing. You know, Silent Mora has been credited with this trick. But he was the first one ever to do this trick, two people holding a handkerchief. Holding a handkerchief, and he do the trick, get two people to hold a handkerchief by the corners and use that as a table and do this trick prevents the balls from rolling around on the floor and everything. Hey, Joe, you want to empty this? Where's Joe? Just empty that some of it. Empty that. I'll use that glass here. Good, good. Nobody got this. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Here, I'll use this glass. It'll be a bit technical. Imagine this is a net. Because the technique is done. That's what I want to show you, the technique. But anyway, Santa Mora, years ago in New York, I, this trick originally, those of you who've read Sack Sleight of Hand, Sack Sleight of Hand, he talks about the, the, the Chinese performers. He said the Chinese are credited with having some wonderful tricks, but he said most of the tricks they did were quite ordinary and not much better than the English or the American performers. But he said there was one quite little trick that they did with little ivory balls and he describes this, this idea of bringing the balls up in the hand. But I, I, I used to do it as a kid, but I never liked tricks where you put things in your mouth. You, do little, you put them in your mouth and pull it out your ear and all that kind of thing. As a little kid, I used to do it, but I, I got corrected that people said well, people like to put things in your mouth. And anyway, I stopped doing it. But Silent Mora had a handkerchief, but he did it with rubber balls. And I said, Mora, do you mind if I use that same method of doing tricks because I said, I love the idea of two people holding a handkerchief doing a trick. He said, well, go ahead. So anyway, I had a chat with, with Toto the Clown. He was a well-known clown years ago. I had a chance to work for 700 kids, and I wanted to do something different. So I got up this trick, and I I didn't know how, how are kids going to see a trick like this, holding a handkerchief, because they must have up close, they couldn't see it. So in those days, my wife used to wear a veil. She had a, a big veil. And I was fooling around, and I dropped the ball in the veil, and I, hold it, I got her to hold the end, and I saw how beautifully visible the balls were in the veil. So I used my wife's veil and did this trick for 700 kids, and they all saw it. And I told Sarah Mora, I said, Mora, I used that ball trick that I did for 700 kids. He says, Werner, you're crazy. He said, eight or ten people couldn't see it. How could you do it for 700 kids? So I told him I used a veil, and oh, he liked that idea, and immediately he adopted it, and he did it in the back. 
but it's, it affected them greatly associated with Charlotte Mora, but I was the one that used the veil. But anyway, I'm just using this class. I want to show you what an effective trick this is. To be, it's very, you don't do this trick the same time you do cups and balls, because it's very similar using the little book. You say I have uh, four rubber balls here. One. Two. Three. Put this other one up, you just, it looks as if you put a second one there. 
But look, here, here's how it looks. Here's what, when you pick this one up, and you don't try to palm this, or you just hold it in your fingers, like that, with enough room. You see, you don't hold it here, like that. Hold it out of sight. Now, when this can comes over, this is all that happens. The ball rolls out, like that, and you, that's, that's all, just like that. Of course, I'm exposing it that way. But don't worry. You let, you get your hand down here. When the hands meet, this ball comes up. Put it there. You take a second, you let it roll. It looks as if you're putting the balls into the hand, but you see they're all in this hand. That's the whole secret, that one little slight let them roll up. And oh, incidentally, when I had to finish, when you got, after you put one in, this, the, the last time, when I, after I make them go from hand to hand, the first time, you see here, on a spring, you put one, then you put a second one, you put a, another one, and another one, now you make the ball come across one, you make the second one come across two, you make the second one, and then you say, oh no, there's still one there. Then you just make an ordinary pass like that and bring that one across. Now the next time you do that, after you've got them all this way, when you make the first ball come across, the second ball come across, when you show this ball this way, you've still got one here, you get it to the outside of your hand, you show it to the gentleman on this side holding the net, and as you bring your hand across to the middle of the net, you let this one drop out, Click this one off, see, all in one move. So this time, you don't have to blow on the hand, you bring the fourth one. Now, you've still got, you say, I'll do it with just three. I'll put one away. No, you don't, you cheat. You, 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 and don't, as I say, don't say, I'll put this one away. Do that. <laughs> say, I'll get rid of this one. Just put your hand in your pocket and come out again. I mean, be brazen about it. Say, we'll put this one away. I'll just use three. So now you've got, you got the extra one. You let one go in there. Let the second one go in there, and you say, how many? And you say, two. You say, you're right. You still got one here. Now you just let those two and hold, uh, show the, in other words, you got the two here and the extra one here. You say, two, that's right. Now you drop over and you show the man on this side, two. And you show the man two, then you just put them both in that hand and take this one and pretend to put it away, and you still got the three again. So you do that as many times as you want. I mean, you put it one, how many? say two, you test over, say that's right, two, one, one, two, and you put this one away, and of course they come back again, you come back again. Now the last time, then you go back to what you started with, you say one there, one there, there's only the original one, so now you see this is so natural, to, you, you, to be rather awkward to palm those two, but holding your hand like that, that makes that easy to hold those. And you say this one, we put away. You put all three away, so all you have to do is slap your hands and come. Well, here's, here's a very interesting trick. I, I, you know, I, how many of you have heard of well, can I have that board? Uh, thanks very much. <coughs> you know, I. I <coughs> My dear friend, you know, Lou Derman, who passed away, a wonderful guy. When I worked in Hawaii at the convention some years ago, Lou Derman wrote it. I don't do any comedy act or anything like that, but I worked with Irene Larson, a very beautiful girl. And uh, he gave me, he wrote a lot of material. He wrote a lot of material for me. One of the things was, I mean, that. Uh, Irene's a very pretty girl. I mean, she threw her arms around me and I did a trick and said, oh, Professor, you're wonderful. She said, will you take a ride for me in my roadster after you're finished tonight in the moonlight? And I said, yes, Irene. Remember, though, I do tricks, not miracles. <laughs> <laughs> another line he gave me, another line. You, I reminded him, I said, well, when Joe, I said, Joe, will you hand me the, this? Because he said, uh, he said, now, you got to laugh with this among the magicians, not among the public, but among the magicians. He said, now, you know, when I do this, when I did this trick before, I, I used to have a, an assistant, an assistant. I said, no, when I do this, I've forgotten the line away, when I, yeah. I said, when I do this trick as a rule, I use an assistant, an assistant, an assistant. But I said, Albert Goshman looks ridiculous in black mesh talking. <laughs> But anyway, I want to show you this trick, which I think is a very fine. Uh, let me see. Oh, there's an extra. Let me have the extra. That's good. Thanks very much. I think this will work this way. I don't know. Try it. Anyway.
Or perhaps it'll be work better this way. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. But anyway, this is a trick. And incidentally, how many know Milton Court? Anybody here know Milton Court? You heard his name, have you? Oh, yeah. well, well, all right. Well, Milton Court, years ago, he said, Vernon, there's a very cute trick. He said, he said, if you'd like to use it on a lecture, he said, I don't know who invented it. He said, it came from England, but I have the faintest idea. So I tried my darndest to find out who invented this trick, and I couldn't find out who invented it. But anyway, it was done by some Englishman many years ago. But I, I, I used it 30 years ago in a lecture, but everybody liked it. And it's a cute little trick to do. But you use some walnuts in, in a glass. That, that was standing. They should have a saucer, but I mean, you, I think you'll be able to see this all right. But anyway, this is three walnuts. Uh, now, you, this is a cover that the uh, that the glass comes in. You put the cover over like that. And you take the walnut.
I fooled the devil out of him with his own card, and I caught one of his cards. He had no idea that I had a big card in his deck. But anyway, now look how simple that is. This trick it doesn't matter what card is selected. We say the ace of diamonds, for instance. Now, when you have this double back card on the top of the deck, you take your ace of diamonds and you say you put your initials on it. All you have to do is square it up, and you take off those two cards and turn them over, and they think the ace of diamonds is there. You put the double back on it, and there's a single card here. Now you can do this. Look, here's the, here's the ace of diamonds. The double back card is there. I turn the two over like that, and apparently put the ace of diamonds under, and it's still there. Now I can really put the ace of diamonds under there, really put it under there. He sees it go under there. Now I push it aside and say, wouldn't it be wonderful if I deal that up? You couldn't see it. Now I turn them over, and the double back lands there, and you've got a single card. So this is a very deceptive thing, and you can fool people. But anyway, that's the really double back card. Now I want to show you. I mean, there's so many hundreds of things. People ask about double lift. Well, to me, one of the worst things you can do is hold a deck of cards like this and do this. This is terrible. This is an abortion. Well, <laughs> who in the world ever takes a pack of cards and does that? If you have the pack up there, if you have the pack up there <coughs> at your fingertips, you might do that because you either have to take it off that way or take it off this way or take it off this way. But if you've got the pack, who, who's going to bother to do that when you can do that? Nobody's going to pick at a card like that. So, I mean, don't be guilty of that. If you want to pick at a card, hold the card at your fingertips. I taught my boy when he was in Annapolis. He, he, he went to Annapolis, he lost $700 playing poker there. And he paid the money in the submarine service, and he had $700, and he went to Annapolis the first month he was there. He lost it playing poker with a boy. So I told him, I said, you're a halfway guy to go lose money, because he told him his father was a magician. He said, he must be a great magician. He didn't teach you how to play cards. <laughs> anyway, I told him a couple of proposition bets with dice. They're proposition bets. And he went back to Annapolis, and, and they, they said, your father's crazy. He doesn't want anything about dice. Or, anyway, my boy went back to 700 with another thousand. But I told him. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Because those know that they, 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 you know, they study mathematics and think they're pretty hip. But there are a lot of those proposition bets. Titanic Thompson who died recently he was one marvelous at that kind of thing. I mean, you know the fellow that he could drive a drive a golf ball a quarter of a mile and you know he went out on Lake Ontario and was frozen on the ice, drove it a quarter of a mile. He used to walk go to Miami, they'd see a sign ten uh, to ten miles to Miami, the sign. He'd say, Well, we'll be in uh, on Flagler Street in five minutes. The guy had just seen the sign 10 miles from Miami. He said, you're crazy. Would you like to bet on it? They didn't know that Titanic Thompson the night before moved that sign. I want to meet Titanic Thompson very much. And we're going to go to Indianapolis. He lived around Indiana. But he did some things that no other living mortal had ever done before. I've never seen him do it, but I, I'm, a, I'm good authority. He can take a key like this. This is true. He take a, a this is the key to the parking over. He'd take a key and he'd bet out of ten throws, he could throw the key in the lock and he'd stand eight feet away and throw the damn thing like that and the key would win the lock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is real mad, this is real chugging. <laughs> <laughs> he'd win a lot of money. He was one of the finest golfers in the world. I mean, and they told me one time that he could beat almost anybody who wanted to play professional golf. But he used to play. But anyway, that's another long story. I can't tell you. I'd just like to mention a few things now about cards in general. I mean, it's about a double lift. Now, look, here, here, here incidentally, I, I, when my boy came home one time, from, he, he asked me, he said, Dad, he said, when he was in the submarine service, he said, Dad, all the boys in the submarine do something. He said, we got a quartet, we got a comedian, a guy plays the ukulele. He said, the guy's got a beautiful baritone voice. He said, I'm the only one, and there's up 30 guys, he said, the only one that doesn't entertain. When we go ashore, he said, we go to the Philippines or something, he said, all the fellows entertain, and I feel like a country bumpkin. and I can't do anything. I said, why don't you do a couple of tricks? He said, oh, I don't like tricks. He never paid any attention to tricks all his life. So when he, later, when he came home, he said to me on one of his leaves, he said, Dad, show me a couple of tricks. I taught him a double lift, I taught him a pass, and I taught him to force a car and a palm, four things. When he went back, he used to be invited up to the Admiral's ship. He went on the Admiral's ship. 
When he tried his Annapolis exam, his name beginning with B, he wouldn't have heard for about six months whether he passed or not. The old admiral said, listen, B sounds like B. He said, I'll put you up with a B. The old admiral put him up with a B. And so he heard right away. It was, you know, B mixed with B. But anyway, he, magic is a wonderful thing as a hobby. I mean, you don't have to use it as a profession, but as a hobby, it's a wonderful hobby. That's all your life. But I get back to what I did. Now, here's a trick. My boy got this trick up. I showed him the double lift. Here's a trick he got up himself. Now, it doesn't matter how the cards are in the shuffle. It doesn't matter. You just pick up the cards. You can do this trick right away. Now, you hold the cards at your fingertips. This is a double lift to use like that. You say, the king of spades. The king of spades. I'm going to bury that card. The king of spades. Bury it. You say, now, can you remember another card? I want you to remember another card. The three of hearts. He says, now look, we put the three of hearts down there. Oh, here's the king of spades. See, the king of spades. You just do that, and that's the three of hearts, and the king of spades is here. But that's a very nice effect with nothing but two double lifts. My boy got that up a, a week after I showed him a double lift. He said, Dad, he said, the transposition was a good effect. He said, look, and he showed him. And I thought, Charlie Miller thinks this is a very beautiful trick. And it is, because look, all you do is take a a double lift, six, seven of hearts, or any card that you have to do. You do a double lift. This is the way, that's the way Leipzig used to do a double lift. All right, the six of hearts. Of course, it's a double lift. So you, now you bury, apparently, the six of hearts. You really bury. It doesn't matter what it is. Now you do another, the seven, another lift, you say the eight of diamonds. Now you put that down, the eight of diamonds. Now you pretend to look. And all you do is make it a pass like that. Do nothing. You say, no, we have the eight of diamonds here, and the six of hearts is here. But that's a good effect in a simple way, just putting it on the Leipzig used this all his life. He used that. He, used, he had the snap. He said there's something in the snap that fools people. But he always held, but don't do that like this, with it, holding the pack. Hold the pack at your fingertips and take two cards and walk them. See, now that sticks together and it's very well, but you take them this way and See, snap them off. Look, take them, snap them. That's a good lift. Now, of course, as I say, a lot of people, they go into a kind of a trance and they get <laughs> 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 don't, don't do, don't, listen. If you don't feel comfortable doing a trick, if you don't feel comfortable, if you feel guilty, if you have a card palm and you feel it's like a bad dream, your hand is getting larger and larger, everybody. <laughs> Don't do it. It's not a good trick for you. You haven't mastered it yet. You must be absolutely oblivious when you palm or you've got to forget that you do it. The greatest example of that is Al Flossel in New York. Al Flossel, he never had any schooling. He worked at Coney Island when he was a kid. But he's got to, he, he forgets all about technique. When you watch Al Flossel, he does beautiful sleight of hand. But you never say, boy, that was beautiful palming. That was beautiful. The act just rolls along, that miser's dream the way he does is beautiful. But as I say, he, he's absolutely unconscious that he's doing any slights, yet the slights are all there. You've got to forget about it. So, I mean, when you palm a, when you do any, anything, like you palm a card, you've got to forget that you palm a card. You can't, you can't, uh, if, you, if you start to get fussy or, gamblers call it telegraphing the move. Now, how many people do you see do this? They're going to make a pass. They're going to do this. They have a card selected, but say here, the eight of diamonds. Now they get their little finger. Now here's what happens. They go, they, get, they, do, they do something, but before they know it, it's too, the gambler will say, too late, too late. You, you better quit because it's like the guy getting down to run. You know he's going to sprint. I mean, you've got, you've got to do it on the offbeat. You've got, you've got to go right into it. I mean, you can't get set. In the same way, look, what are you going to do? It? A lot of people do a change like this. Here they are. They, they're going to do the top change. They do like this. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do something. Well, you've got to be absolutely relaxed. A perfect example of that. A perfect example of that is Molini, Max Molini. Now he's a, there's a trick like they're bringing the two red aces out together, where you bring them out, you deal them from the bottom. You know, it's called the Siamese aces. You put them in. Some guy cuts the cards over. A lot of you fellows must be familiar with it. And then another guy cuts the cards, and he thinks he blows up the trick. But the two aces come out together. Well, the ordinary way of doing that is with a key card, using a key card. But Max Bellini used to do this by by nicking a card. He'd put a little nick in the card, another nick in the card, 
And he let you shuffle the cards. Now he he keep dealing them like this, and when he came to the nick on the card, he'd do a glide and pull it back, and then until he came to the other ace, that he'd bring out the two aces together. But I'm just mentioning how Molini, how artistic Molini was about about putting a little nail neck in. Now if I hold up this card and suddenly pinch it, you can see I'm doing something. The card is a fragile kind of a thing. You don't squeeze it or anything. Now if you want to nick this card, if you want to nick this card, just put your fingernail in it. Here's what Molini would do. Molini would say, look. Now as he was doing that, he was nicking this card. <laughs> now he'd say. And as he was doing that, he'd nick this card. But you see that strong misdirection he used just to nick two cards. The average guy thinks he could do that, do that, and get away with it. But, but as I say, every move should have misdirection on it. Now the misdirection on there's a top, I mean, you know, all the top change is like, like this, the bottom change is like this, and the so-called Hofstadter change is done with just with the same grip. But look at the bottom change done this way, the bottom change. Look, you take the card slowly like this. Of course, you don't, I mean, you don't say the bottom change. You're doing this as a trick. You say the two are covers. I take it this way, and I watch this very closely. You rub it underneath, changes to the edge. But look, here's the theory of the thing. I, I, I want to get two different cards. When you take a card to do the bottom change, you do this slowly, 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 slowly. When you come here, you go fast, and then slowly again, slowly and slowly, and then you turn, you do it. So in other words, the move is here, here's an ace of spades, now watch, and I just rub it on my sleeve like that, and it changes to the deck of diamonds. Now that's the misdirection. The misdirection for putting, putting, I'm going to, now the, the top change is done this way, or the top change is done this way. Uh, now, supposing I'm going to change this queen of spades for, a, for, for the jack of diamonds. Or here, we'll take the eight cards. It's an easy one to remember. Now, look, what? The only way you can change a card, unless you're drawing it from hand to hand, is by the hands crossing. Now, it would look ridiculous if you cross your hands that way. You don't cross them. If you cross them this way or that way, you've got to get across your hands. So here's what you do. You've got the queen of spades. You lay it on, you lay it here like this. Now, you, you do this. I say, can you see that all right? You lay, now, when you come back, look, the hands cross, you do that, and then on your king. But look, you see this here? When you come back, you, you, you put something here, anything, you'd have a glass, or you say, well, put the ace of spades here. Now, you really put it there. You put it there. And, and you fuss around, and you say, you make, you make out that that's very important. You show the card again. But when you come back, you, 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 you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You don't do that. You put it here. When you come back, you do this, and then you put it down and you change the card. Or you can do the same thing. When you put the card here, you come over this way and put it down and you change it. Or if, you, if you're doing it, if you're doing it, supposing you've got a some place to put it up on a mantelpiece or something. You know, you say the ace of spades. Now you don't make a change this way. You say I'm going to put it up there. You see, you bring the card there. You say I'm going to put it up there where you can all see it. Now you come down. You, like this, here. I'm going to put it up there where you can see it. Right up there, see? And you put it up there and it's changed. <laughs> I'm going to put the card up there, see, where you can see it, up there. But in other words, this hand comes up there. You come back, you change, and this hand goes over. This, this, and this, or this, this, and this. Now, in other words, you change it when the hand across. But anyway, and another thing here, another very important thing. When you're doing a... I don't want to get a contrasting card so you can see what I'm talking about. But when you're doing a color change, now color change is one of the finest effects in magic. Oh, incidentally, I'll, I'll show you that one after. I'm, uh, so many. You know, a funny thing, I just said to Steve Freeman before I left, he's from Oklahoma. I said, you know, it's, it's impossible, Steve, to give a lecture on it because he knows, he's a very fine side of Andrew for me. I can talk, really, I, I mean, without repeating myself, I can talk for five hours and nothing but color change. I really mean it, because there are at least 30 or 40 different ways to do a color change. There are 10 ways of doing switch. Or, I mean, there's so much to the card, you can't cover it in, in a short space of time. But I want to show you something about, about color change. Now, I mean, if you do a color change like this, you know, that's very ordinary. Malini, he used to use an old chain where he could bring his hand like this. But the, not the palming, but the actual change should be done 
in a mysterious kind of a way, not going passing your hand. Now watch the action on this. I'll do the, I'll do this in the way Molina used to do. We come like this, you do this, like this, see? See, that's a very effective change, much better than doing this kind of thing. The same now, now stand up so you can see this. Now watch, with, it, oh, with the fingers wide open. Now Leipzig used to say, well, by slapping the car, change it. Now, on, on this, uh, incidentally, this is, a, this is a very good thing to do. If you're going, I just have to see that. To do this, to say, don't try to whip. <laughs> Excuse me. My hands are so dry, I love that. Anyway, I say, now don't try to rub the car. Just take it, pick a spot off, like that. Oh. <laughs> now, that has a very good effect. People always laugh. It's much funnier when you do that than changing the color. Just, just slip the car on top. But when you do that, look, you, you do a side slip, you come over and you just pick it, but it's a funny effect. And it's always effective. Now here's the, here's the thing I want to show you. Like this. I do. Now this, I had this in one of my books. I don't, don't ask me which, which book, because I don't know. <laughs> but I want to show you using a, using the uh, using the Tenkai palm. Now a lot of people don't know what the Tenkai palm is. They have difficulty doing it. Look, take a card, lay your thumb across there like that and do that. Now, of course, you don't stand that way or you don't stand this way. You stand with your hand this way. Now, if you have your hand in a natural, keep this card parallel with the floor, the hand looks perfectly natural and you can do different things with it. Now, let me show you how to make this into a nice color change using this move. You said, I don't rub my hand over the cards like that to change it. I do it with the fingers wide open. Watch. <laughs> Look, come on. All you do is take the card off, and that's, you say, I don't do this with my fingers wide open. <laughs> I, look, I, I'm going to change the card, and I'm going to keep my fingers wide open. See? Now you come down, you say, what? Now, I want to replace those cards on top. 
This is something that I've never seen in a book, and then gamblers know this, but I've never seen it in a book. You want to replace this card. Now, most people, as I say, they, they put their hand right on top and pull the cards over like that. But when you want to replace a card on the deck, you come over here and you drop the card and pick the deck up. I mean, it's simple. Look, oh, oh, you got the card. You just come pick the deck up like that. It's so much better than this. Because, look, if you want to, supposing you're doing a, a trick where you're making cards, so many cards go from one place to the other, and you want to replace, you want to replace a card on here in the fairest possible way. You've got two very keen-eyed people sitting at the table, and you want to replace this card on top of this pile. Now, what's the action of this? What's the action? See, it doesn't look as if you're putting anything on the card. Watch, I'll do it again. Here's the card. Watch. You see, the whole thing is this. <clears throat> this package is in motion. It's in motion when the card falls. Look, the thumb hits it and starts it in motion, and it falls and does that. So in other words, you have to blend that all into one movement. In other words, this pack is moving when the card is dropped. Whereas if I just did it dropped it, then moved it, you see it drop. But the thumb starts the thing moving, and as it moves across, this drops and the hand does that. So if this is done in a natural way, see, you got some, they just counter the cards and you say, now sir, will you take those cards and just put your hand on top of them? It doesn't look as if you're adding cards. So, and that's the right. Oh, and incidentally, let me show you one more thing here before I forget. Supposing you, this applies to gambling, but you can also apply it to magic very well. And supposing here I've got six cards in my hand, and then you can't win a poker hand with six cards, you get shot. You've got, <laughs> you got six cards and you've got to get rid of them. Now, this is a true story. Some years ago, oh, it must have been 12, 15 years ago, in, in Hollywood, I met a very clever gambler. And he said, Vernon, he, I, I wanted to learn something from him. He said, did some things. I didn't know what they were. They were beautifully done. And he said, well, I don't show anything. He said, I don't show anything. He said, you show me how I can get a card, he says, from my left hand into my right hand under the closest scrutiny. And he says, I'll show you anything you want to know. So I went back to the hotel, and I was thinking, how in the world can you get a card? Of course, I used to do this hand washing thing, which, well, incidentally, I'll do that to show you what I mean. But if you put a card in the center, deck like this, three of hearts, and you ripple the card like that, and it comes to the top, you say, well, you can see it come up when I do that. But if I do it on the table here, you can't see it come up, because I do this, and then, and then I do this, and it comes to the top, see? But this is a diagonal palm shift, the diagonal palm shift, card is palm there, but, but by bringing my hands together and wiping my hands like that, I get it over into this hand and do that. But this, this, is, this is a, so I thought of this. I, I showed him. I said, well, if you've got a card palm in this hand, I said, you can do this and then get it in the other hand. You can rub your hands together and get it in the other hand. You see, you can take it from hand to hand like this. And it takes the crimp out, incidentally, too, because it's pretty that way, and you take the crimp out and put it here. Well, I devised that many, many years ago. But he said, that's good. But he said, that's the magician's palm. He said, we never, we never use a palm like this. Gambler never, well, I won't say never, perhaps sometimes he uses it. They all use the gambling palm, which is this. The gambling palm is that, or this. Only two ways they palm, is that way or, the, or this way. Because when you've got cards palm this way, your hand is natural. You can play with chips, you can square up the pack, you can do all kinds of things. Smoke a cigarette, cigar, but you certainly can't. It looks like you have a hot potato in your hand. Right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything. I mean, the only thing you can do when you play a card that way is to sit, if you're doing a trick at a table, to sit with your hands this way, or perhaps to stroke your hair, or do this, or put your hand on the table, or have, a, have something in your hand. Now then, all those, you have something in your hand, the hand looks perfectly normal. Or if you sit, oh, but you can't stay in one position. You have to be doing, you have to do something, or you, you feel guilty anyway. This way you don't feel guilty. You don't feel, your, your hand is in full sight. You, you can do all kinds of things with your hand. Well, anyway, so he said, I want you to show me how to transfer a card from this position. Now, this is true. I was in Hollywood, as I say, about 17 years ago. It may have been less than 150 years ago. I don't know. But anyway, a long time ago. And uh, I was sitting up at night waiting for Charlie Miller to come over, and I, I was thinking, how in the world can you bring your hands together under what pretext? I thought you could look at your ring, you could look at your cuff, you could 
bring their entire tie. And I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. And I, I, I said, well, I don't think we can do this. Uh, I kind of was giving up. I thought, I don't know what, I can't solve this thing. And I suddenly thought, gee, it's getting late. And I, looked, I went, boy, I said, because I did this perfectly naturally. I did that. So I thought, so I came up with this idea, which is very full of the thought. Uh, here's the three of hearts. Uh, I've got the card. I, I don't care which side you watch from, any side. And I, I can say, well, I've got the three of hearts here. I want to get the card over and return it to the back. So I say, well, this only lasts about three minutes. <laughs> and I've got it over here. Now look, all right, look on this side, look this side. I say, well, this trick only takes about two seconds to do. And I've got it here. Or from this side, I say, see, here's the card. Say, that only takes about two seconds to do. But that's a perfectly natural move. Look, there's a card. I just bring this hand over. That little figure takes that corner and just pulls it like that. And you can do the same thing, go back with it if you want. But you wouldn't go back with it because you're looking at your wristwatch. See, but this is a perfectly normal move to say, well, I've got time for one more trick. Well, anyway, that's the so I here. Now, I want to show you why, why this fellow wanted this move. I'll get back to the six cards again. He has, he has six cards. He's got an extra card. Now, look how artistic this is. The pack is over here. The pack is over here. Now, he wants to get rid of a card. Now, here's the book. This is the palm. See, there's the palm. You can hold your hand perfectly normal. That's the palm. The card is palm. You look at your hand. And put, there's the palm, like that. Now, here, here's the way you get rid of that card. Look, what? It's your deal. Hmm. You see? <laughs> <laughs> look, you see? The card is here. Look, you can do this in slow motion. You can say, well, go ahead. It's your turn to deal. You can't see anything happen at all. So this fellow, what he wanted, he had the card here. Now, he wanted to put his hand down. But when the pack is over here, he, he couldn't come over here and do this like that. So he wanted to say, well, Getting late or whatever it is, and they pick up the pack and go ahead. Ah, but anyway, he showed me a couple of things for giving them that little tip. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, I haven't even mentioned anything about uh, second dealing. Now the reason, the reason, uh, the reason gamblers use use B cards rule is because the margin. When you spread cards out, you see you can't see whether two are spread or one is spread or what happens. So it's a big advantage to deal a card with a B card for dealing second. Uh, you wrote the Houdini book with it. Anyway, the party, what? No, Laurie Gibson wasn't even around then. Uh, uh, Houdini was the best player in the world. Well, anyway, the card is here. 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 The you see, I don't like, I, I, as I was saying tonight to some of the fellows, there are more nice people at Magic than any other location. I don't care. People are very few, but a fellow who will sneak backstage when the guy's performing, and examine his apparatus, or take it apart, or make drawings, and expose it in magazines, I don't think he's a very nice magician, because, you know, you shouldn't do that. I mean, if a fellow has a trick, you don't snoop back and make a sketch of it, and measure it, and, or go into a guy's pocket and steal a gimmick, and, and I'm right about it, so I, I, I don't like that. But anyway, I shouldn't even say that. Anyway. But anyway, I want to say something about dealing seconds. Now, in early days, they tell you to push two cards off like that. Well, the average person can't do that. Because, oh, I, I got off the subject about Dr. Elliott. Dr. Elliott, when I met him, he said, Vernon, isn't it funny? He said, you came to New York here, you're only young, I was in my early 20s, so I was in the Royal Canadian Air Force at the time, in my uniform. He said, you studied magic up in Canada. And he said, you're so much better than most of these guys in New York. He says, uh, he said, you, you know why? I said, I, I don't know. I said, I'm not, I put a lot of time in it. But, uh, he said, no. He says, you use your head. And he says, you, you're natural. He said, magic is the simplest thing in the world if you do two things. Use your head and be natural. He said, two little words, be natural. So what I was talking about, if you take a coin and you do this, <laughs> if you take a coin and do that, it's natural. Be natural. Don't, this, that's why some of the wives of magicians, they see their husbands. And they think I married some kind of a jackass. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, I'm not
finest performers around, a professional performer, he used to give lessons, and he told me, he said, you take a, an ordinary man and you put a coin on the table, and that, uh, that's a quick coin, I don't want to get any kind of a coin. <laughs> anyway, here to get back of the card. Uh, I'm warming up now. <laughs> card back slightly and, and push two cards off. Well, look, it's, you read the instructions, it's hard to do, but this, I'm going to put this card face up so you can see what I mean. If you pull a card back like that and put your thumb where the two cards come together and push, anybody can push two cards off. Anybody. I don't care. The first time you try it, you can push two cards off. If you pull that card back and push, you can push two cards off. Anybody can do that. Of course, with a card face down, I mean, here you take, you push two cards up. Now, you do that. Now you put the card up a little higher, a little higher, and you push, and you still get two cards. But you pull the card, don't try to deceive yourself or anybody, just keep doing that. You, you put, 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 put off two cards each time. Now pull it back just the width of a margin, just the white short. Push there, and two cards will come on. Two cards, push just the width of the margin. Don't do it with the other hand. Don't try to do it with one hand. Don't try to do it with one hand. After you can, after you can do this like that, push two cards off. You do that. Now try pulling it back with the thumb a little, and then push it, and you'll get two cards off. Pull it back a little with the thumb and push, and you get two cards off. Pull it back with a thumb a little and push, you get two cards. And the cards look as if they're in perfect alignment. They're not in perfect alignment, but they come off two at a time. So if you do that, push off and just take the second card and pull that. I mean, that's the way you learn to do this, this push off second. I mean, of course, you don't do it slowly like that. But you push off two cards each time. Now, they look as if they're almost perfect. You can't do that the first time you try it, naturally. You speed it up, you get so it looks like a, like a, a second deal. But now, that's one form of second deal. Now, it, now with, of course, with a card like this, the illusion is perfect. But here's a better second. That, that's all right for gambling. That's all right for gambling. But you, now, you can also, incidentally, you can also do it this way by taking the card. Here's the eight of diamonds. If you want to turn the card face up, you can do it like this, take it, hit it like that, and turn it. And that's a different stylus of a second. But here, here's the best second for magic is this. If you've got a card here, and you push, if you push that like that, you can't push two cards. But if you put your thumb back, in other words, instead of just pushing like that, put your thumb well back, bring it well back, and push. Keep pushing, and as, you, as the thumb straightens out, that second card will come. You push, you keep pushing, as the thumb straightens out, the second card comes. Like that. Push, the second card comes. <clears throat> now, of course, you've got to keep these fingers, because if you don't, if you keep these fingers loose, four or five will come over. So you've got to keep your fingers, as, act as a gauge on the side there, and the second <coughs> card comes off. Now, here's the point. They don't have them books, or they don't they have to pick up. When you push the card this way, and you push the second card comes out, don't reach under there and get the card. Just let those fingertips take that card and do that, and then you take it. In other words, this is in slow motion. This is what happens. This, 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 and this. All in one, this, but this. The left hand does the work. Look, the left hand does the work. See, this is here. The left hand does. So when you when you, you when you now look when you've got a card like this, when you've got a card like this, the Queen of Hearts. Watch this card comes over, and you lay it right down. I mean, you you it blends right in. You can you can see, and you've got your Queen of Hearts there. Or if you take it this way, the same thing applies this way. You see, Queen of Hearts. But what you're actually doing is pushing, and then the fingers do that. You take the card. Do that. These fingers hit. You take the card. But it's not hard. And the same thing when apply bottom dealing. People try bottom dealing, you can take it out of here or you can take it out from here. But most people try to just pull the card off. You don't pull it off, you pinch it off. Look. Just take the pack and do do this. Look, take the pack and you see that look. Pinch like this. This is I'm taking the top and the bottom together. I'm just 
I'll try to illustrate the, the action of taking the cards off. You don't try to pull it off, you squeeze like that. You see, look, in other words, you squeeze. So, you don't take the top card with it. When you take the bottom <coughs> card, you keep your thumb there, but you squeeze that card. See, so in other words, it's hard to illustrate this the distance. You squeeze, and the card comes right up through here. So these fingers don't do that. The card comes up like a knife. It's just like in a color change. Look, I, I, when you want to bring your hand up, see, without these fingers moving, the card comes up. It comes up this way. It doesn't come out this way because your fingers have to move to let it out. The card cuts up there like that. The same thing applies to the bottom wheel. It comes out like that. It doesn't come out to straight. So the fingers are in the way. It has to come up. It has to come up that way. See, that comes up that way. It doesn't come straight out because the fingers have to move. But uh, and I, I haven't let you ask any questions. Please ask me any questions. You've got to stimulate me a little. Uh, Dave, what? Show us a, a double uh, lift. You were on it. Yeah. Oh, did I? I, I should rest, in other words. Okay. But look, well, as I say, to me, the double lift, I'm responsible. I'm responsible, I think, for a bad habit. But you've got to understand why the habit is made. But the turning cards over. I mean, that, they're turning a card like that. Now, the reason is this is good, because you can do this. You can turn over like that. And I turned over, look how many cards I turned over. Because once the card is lined up, you can't tell whether they're four or five or what they are. Because once you turn a card like that, who can tell how many there are there? I've only got two there. But you can also turn, look, you can take the cards like this. Once they're squared up like that, look, I've got all those. So you can tell. But, so in other words, but here's the way originally I did this double lift. When you want to get, I can count the cards with my little finger. I can count down this way. Because I went with a hand over, I count the cards with my little finger down there. Not with that one, with a little finger. But this is sometimes I bother to take a double left to get, get the second card like that. Now I've got two cards with a break there. But that's not necessary. If you're going to, you're going to, I'm going to show the top card. There's nothing wrong with saying, would you like to see that top card? I'm pushing two over. Or take the top card and say, I'm going to use this top card. And push the second one over, get a break, and come back and stop. I've got my break. Now, when you do this, you, you, you see this bend in the card. Make it look like a single card. And make it look, because when the cards, when the two cards come off, you see, look, they're controlled. They're, they stick to, absolutely stick together. You can't see that they're two cards there. Because the bend, I think six and a seven are bad. But here, here, we take this. Look, when I take these cards like this, the jack and the seven. But, See, even doing this is a good effect, the seven. If we put it under again and do it, of course, this isn't as good as a double card, but I mean, it's a very effective, very effective thing to do for an ordinary layperson. It's an effective move. But when you, want it, when, you do it, uh, when you do a double lift, you do an ordinary double lift, hold it by the two corners. Look, you're perfectly safe as long as you've got the card by the two corners, as soon as you come to the corner, you can turn the card around, it looks very... Now here, here's it. Years ago, I got up a trick called the fingerprint trick. Now, how many of you know? Do any of you know the fingerprint? You know the fingerprint trick? Well, here, I'll show you the fingerprint trick. Here, here. I mean, I want you, because this applies to the, what I'm talking about. It's a very stupid thing to take a card, to show a card like that, and then turn it down and take it off because you should take the card off from here. Or at least you, should, you shouldn't turn it right down flush and then take it off. So when you show a double card like this, now that's, that makes it look so much better. You see, in other words, I don't put the card back even on top of the deck. I don't put it down evenly. When I put that card down, this comes down, but immediately it's fanned out. So it looks, you see, the effect is good. See, there's the... I just do that well that time here. See, I've got the card, you put it down like that. It looks as if you put the card down. Now, to illustrate how effective that is, I'll show you with the ace of spades. I'll show you with the ace of spades. I used to do a trick a long time ago, if I got what the trick was. But this is using this one slice. Now, watch. Say the ace of spades. What? Wait, that's not good. The ace of spades. 
So if you've got a tech like this, you can do a lot of very clever tricks. But you see, the effect is good. Of course, you don't do this, but I'm just showing you what a good effect this is. You keep on your looks. Because the fact that the card, the fact that the card doesn't go right even, I put it down and bam, so that it drops like that. <coughs> You got a good effect of it. Much better than just putting it back perfectly even. Uh, wait, oh, I tried to. Right? Fingerprint. Oh, yeah, the fingerprint. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good trick, by the way. I, I won't bother anybody taking a card. Name a card. I'll show you. Name a card. Somebody call it a card. What? Eight of hearts. Eight of what? Hearts. Why? Did you see that on there? Well, anyway, no, the name's a lot of them. Jack of Diamonds. The what? Jack of Diamonds. Jack of Diamonds. But well, suppose the Jack of Diamonds is the card. The Jack of Diamonds was the card. Now, let's see. Uh, Jack of Diamonds. That's the selected card. Yeah, the selected card. Well, anyway, you put the card down in the first place. Let them put their thumbprint. You ask some lady or some man to put up their thumbprint on the card. Now you shuffle the cards. I mean, you get the card to shuffle it, and so on and so forth. You cut them. The Jack of Diamonds is the selected card, see? Now you tell them. <coughs> Now this is a, uh, well, I'll tell you after. Uh, now you say, the light isn't very good. The light is very good here. I wouldn't say that. I'd say the light is too strong here. I can't see the fingerprint. And you say, no, I, definitely. No, that's not your car, definitely. It's hard to see in this light here. No, that's not your car. The King of Hearts. No, that's definitely not your car. The, uh, Wait a minute. No, no, wait, 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 no, I, I, wait a minute, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, I did this wrong. I haven't done this for a long time. I did it wrong. I'll do it again in a minute. Uh, here. I've got to see. Well, I have to do the how do you select your card because I can't do it again. Would you take your card, take out any card you like, take out one. Go to everybody. All right. And turn it any place you like in the bag. Perfectly honest. See, I haven't done this for a long time. All right, now I say, uh, I don't know what your card is, but of course, you, you when you touch it, you put your, your fingerprint on it, see? No, it definitely wasn't that card. No. No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. Oh, yeah. See your print on there? What was your card? What? <laughs> I did this trick wrong. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I haven't done this for so long. I've got enough to. I passed it. No, that's very bad. Wait a minute. I, I, I shouldn't have done these tricks. I haven't done for years. But here, I, 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 now I know what I did wrong. We'll, take, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use the same nine of spades. We'll use the same nine of spades. We'll use the same nine of spades. Which, suppose this is what I should have done. I turn the card over like that and I say, no, definitely, that's not it. I say, definitely, that's not it. Now I take the card this way. I say, definitely, that's not it. Definitely, that's not it. I say, yes, you can see the fingerprint down there, then you turn to the nine space. You see, they say you pass three times before. It's a good effect, but if you sell it, because you pretend that you see the fingerprint. Now look, here's all you do. See, I've forgotten the position of the card. I, used to, I put five, in other words, I make the card, the fifth card, from the top of the pack. Now, for instance, the ace of diamonds is the card. So I make it the fifth card from the top of the pack. See, in other words, I shuffle it or bring it to the fifth position from the top of the pack, the ace of diamonds. So I turn over one card, and I look at it, and I say, no. See, there's an excuse to put the card back even on the pack, because I'm looking at the card. There's an excuse to put it back. So I look at the second card, the jack of hearts. And I say, no, there's no print on that. Now, as I push that off, I push over, fan the cards, so when I grab them up, I've got three cards there. Now I turn over, that they see the ace of diamonds. There really is three cards left. Now I look at that, and I say, no, definitely, no mark on there. 
It says triple this so I could turn this card over. Jack of spades, and I said, definitely not that one. Now when I now I do a double lift. I say, yes, she has got the top ring for it. And they say, no, you have passed it. They say, no, that's, uh, now they always grab these cards, I think there's a duplicate. But that's the figure. But you see, the only reason I mention this trick is there's a reason to turn this card down, to, to look at it. But it would be foolish to take this ace of diamonds and put it down here, and then take it off for no reason. But this gives you a reason. You look at it, then you take it off. Right? So it's a good thing when you do a... Sometimes when you turn over two cards as one, you want an excuse. I mean, you turn over, say, the four of spades, you say, that has a little blemish on it or something, but it's not the four. I mean, yeah, there's an excuse to look at it. Ask me some questions. I haven't asked me any questions. I've been talking so much. Show us uh, some ways of controlling cards to the top, ways that you like. Or well, <clears throat> the double cut is the simplest and best way. Of course, the pass, there's nothing better than a pass. There's nothing better than a pass. A pass and a force and a change are excellent. The old-fashioned ways are very, very good. But here, to me, the best way, I mean, to uh, when you have the card selected and put back, I mean, you can, have, you can have it put back this way or have it put back any way you like or have it put back. I personally think it, it's a fair way to, to fix the card and let them push the card in anywhere they want, push the card in. Now you can push it in a little diagonally like that, and you push it down through the pack. Now, you can either get the card to the top by bearing down or get it to the bottom by, by bearing up. Now, for instance, this card here, which suppose this is the card, the four of spades. Now, you put, you push it in the pack and do that, but it's sticking out the back. Now, if I want it on the top, I just, now you can cut off a few cards at a time like that and then cut to the break. That's a very nice way of bringing a card to the top of the pack. And of course, if you want it to the bottom, you do the same thing, but you, you, you cut this way and you, you cut this way and cut different, pick them up any way at all like this and you get the card in the bottom. But I mean, but be careless about it. Don't do it in a methodical way. And of course, another thing that people don't do when they do this, this Hindu shuffle, they hold the brake generally with the thumb like that, cut the cards off like that. Leipzig used to do this as a force. He used to have the nine of diamonds like this. And he'd take the cards and cut them like this. Now he'd take off a few like this and he'd say, stop me anytime you like. Now they'd say, stop. Whenever they said stop, he'd just pull the whole thing off and show the card was there. Which is a very nice little effect to say, stop me anytime. Because the moment they say stop, you pull them all off to the break. But, but you can also hold a break with the thumb or with the right little finger. With the right, right little finger. Most people don't do that. That's a very nice way to hold a pack because you can, you can look down on the card and you can't see that you're holding the break with this finger. It's better than holding it with your thumb because the angles aren't as good. But wait, now, there, you know, this, here's an excellent way, too. Eight of clubs. Supposing I want to keep that card on. Oh, here, here. No, I'm getting away from something. The best way to control a card. Look, this is the best way. When a person peeks at a card. I, I can't have you peek at one. But I peek at one. Yeah, no, just look at one. Look at one. Look, do this. What was your card? See, this, this is the most natural way. The most natural way, you've got a break there. But don't do this. See, that's what I mean, telegraphing a move. You're doing something. See, you're, you've got to take hold of the deck, the break, and turn the pack down in a natural way. Look. Hold your break. When you take the pack, you just press with your thumb and you swivel those cards and immediately shuffle the block to the top and leave it there. But this is what so many people do. They, they hold the break all right, but now they, see? You can see that they're feeling for something. They're just, just put your hand there at the break and go right into the shuffle. The shuffle and shuffle carelessly and leave the card on the bottom. Now, incidentally, here's a nice way to leave a card on the bottom. Eight of clubs. Watch. Watch, I'll do that again, watch. This is a French shuffle. That's good for keeping your card on the bottom. That's a bit of more questions. Wait, let me see what other ways. Oh, there's so many ways to control cards. I mean, many different different ways to control Wait, oh, I know something I want to show you. Here. Peanut with trick of Brother Hayman. This is a very, very finely constructed trick, beautiful trick. And if any of you do it, I'll show you a way to 
finishes it makes a very nice effect. You know, Dr. Daly was a very dear friend of mine. I think I started him in the better class of magic because when he first started he wasn't too interested, but then he got fascinated by magic and he was one of the really clever amateurs in the country. Uh, anybody play Pinochle in here? Yeah. Maybe for the Queen of Spades. I can't find the Queen of Spades. Oh, here it is. Thank you, pardon? You know, you're a pinochle player? Huh? <laughs> well, anyway, this is, this is a, you know, Dr. The reason I mentioned Dr. Daly, Dr. Daly claims that every good trick has a discrepancy in it. And this is very true. A lot of the finest tricks in magic have a, a violent discrepancy, but people don't notice the discrepancy. Now, this trick of Brother Havens has a violent discrepancy, very, very great discrepancy. But the discrepancy was so good that Steve Freeman, Larry Jennings, and uh, Mike Skinner, all of us, saw Brother Heyman do this trick the first time he got it up. Not one of us noticed the discrepancy. Now, this is pretty good. It's a violent discrepancy, but not one of us noticed it. So I'll show you what the trick is. Wait a minute, I want to see if not I'll show you this anyway. Now here's the trick. This is you say you, you get somebody, you get somebody, you hand them the card and say, I want you to count these cards in my hand one by one. See that I only have four. That's one, two, three, four. They count the cards. There are definitely only four cards. Now you say, How, who plays pinochle? You know what pinochle is. If you've got the Jack of Diamonds and the Queen of Spades, that's pinochle. The Jack of Diamonds and the Queen of Spades. I've only got four cards here. Jack of Diamonds, and on the bottom, the Queen of Spades. Now here we have another Jack of Diamonds and another Queen of Spades. So I've got double peanut now, double peanut. Now, peanut, double peanut, with two Jacks of Diamonds, two Queen of Spades. Now if you're playing poker, you can't take a very good hand out of two Jacks or two Queens. But poker, if you take the bottom card, the Queen, like this, one there, another, another Queen like this, another queen like this, and a jack, you've got three queens. Now you can't beat three queens with three jacks, but if you take the uh, bottom jack like this, take the bottom jack, and this jack, and this jack, and this jack, you've got four jacks, so you've got a hand that beats three queens. So, we've got one, we've only got, uh, we've only got uh, one, two, three, four cards. But what are these cards? Are there two jacks, two queens, one queen, three jacks? What are they? The average person says, I don't know what they are. I say, well, that's an ace. And this bottom one is an ace. And this is an ace, and this is an ace. So you've got four aces. <laughs> now that's only with four cards. Now, if you want to do this, you say, now I'm going to show you another trick with the four aces, and you go and you put the four aces out and do another trick. But there are no trick cards, there are no extra cards, there's nothing. All you use, see the discrepancy is that I never showed you an ace of hearts and never showed you an ace of spades. I only showed you the ace of diamonds and the ace of clubs twice. In other words, you didn't see four aces. You know, this is hard to do under these circumstances, but here are the cards. It's the simplest trick in the world. I made it even simpler than Brother Hayman. A red jack, an ace of diamonds and a jack of diamonds. Now you don't use the ace of spades and the queen of spades, you use the ace of clubs and the queen of spades. So there, there's your setup. That's all you use. An ace of diamonds, a jack of diamonds, ace of clubs, and the queen of spades. Now you take the cards and you split them like that and show the, this is a double here. You show the jack of diamonds and the queen of spades. Now you turn them down and you do a double lift. You show the jack of diamonds. You show the jack of diamonds. And you put that one down. Now you show the bottom card, and you, but you just take off the two off the bottom, push the top one aside, and show the queen of spades, double, and put that down. Now you take the bottom one again, show the jack of diamonds again, and show the queen of spades again. Now you scoop it up. You take that back, you scoop these cards up, which is perfectly nice. <coughs> now you say, if I want to play poker, you show the bottom card, the queen of spades, you take the top card away and lift three cards off, Put that one down. Now you left two cards off. Put that one down. Then show the queen, and then show the jack, and scoop with the jack. 
Now, you say you can't you beat three queens, but uh, you got to have four jacks to beat. So you show the bottom card, push the top one aside, take all the cards, put the jack down, take the double, show the jack, put the double. When you put the jack down, you do a very bold thing. You put it right underneath the bottom, you take that off, and you show the jack again. And you show that you've only got four cards, that's all four cards. Now, you do a double, you show the ace of diamonds. You don't name ace of diamonds. You say, there's one ace, put it down. Show the bottom one, but you take off the two. You show that, then you hesitate for a second. You say, this ace and this ace. And now, I, the way I do, I have the other two aces with Edith on the top of the pack. So I pick up the pack, and I palm them off, pick up these, and say, would you like to see another trick with the four aces? And I've got four aces. Anyway.